So let's take a look at what you get when you order a Flying Cinema X24 and how it goes together. Everything comes individually bagged like you see here. Uh, even the screws are separated out by size. So very nice. Uh, this is what you expect from uh, a medium to high dollar frame. And uh, it's nice to see that you get it here. You get a really nice set of installation instructions here. Uh, a professional looking uh, CAD drawing with all the exploded diagram. And this should really be most of what you need to put this frame together. Uh, there's a little bit of double checking that you got your screw sizes correct. I found it was not always easy for me to tell which screw size was intended to go there. But that's probably more because I'm dumb and I didn't have a caliper with me to make sure I was putting the right size screws in. Honestly, I always just do that by trial and error. It's usually pretty obvious. If you put the screw in and it sticks out, it's too long. And if you put the screw in and it doesn't go all the way, it's too short. And if you run out of screws, you use the wrong size. So bear in mind that this frame, like all, I think all four millimeter arm frames should do, includes a set of motor screws. Because most motors come with screws sized for three millimeter arms. So if you use four millimeter arms like this frame has, then they won't be long enough. Okay, so you've got 16 extra screws in the set intended for your motors. Here I've begun assembling the bottom plate and the arms, and you can see that the innermost screws are extra long and go up through the plate, and they form the base for the PDB and the flight control stack. I'm not usually a fan of using metal screws for your flight control stack, but in this case, the metal screws are only going to interface with the PDB, and then there will be nylon standoffs going on top of them for the flight controller. I'm not a fan of using the metal screws because I feel like they're more likely to transfer force to the electronic components when the frame flexes and it's going to flex. So I feel like using nylon screws for your flight control stack is more likely to preserve your components over the long term. That's just a hunch that I have. Uh, but but that's the, so this would not be by preference, but I understand that for this style of frame, there isn't very many ways around it. Uh, you have to use metal screws to hold the arms in, and it doesn't make sense to have a whole new set of screw holes just for your flight control stack. I am glad that the flight controller is on nylon screws. Uh, the PDB, you know, maybe a little more robust. Although if you're using an RROSD or other PDB with integrated electronics like I do, then it may be taking some hits. And, and there's not a lot you can do about that. Here you can see how the PDB and the nylon standoffs go on top of those metal screws. Uh, depending on which regulators you decide to use, uh, you may need uh, some additional standoffs to space the PDB away from the frame a little bit more. It just all depends. Uh, frankly, for the price of a Pololu, five or seven dollars, you can get a, a four dollar Maytech PDB that has a 12 volt and a 5 volt regulator on it and I honestly might just go that direction uh, instead of trying to put a pololu or two on this PDB. Here you can see the right angle brackets that attach the top of the frame to the base plate. Uh, they're right here in the center of the frame. The screw goes up through the bottom of the plate similar to a normal standoff but then there's this right angle hole that a screw goes into to hold the frame on. These are the plates of the top part of the frame. And here you can get a close-up look at how the camera plate angle is set. It's a very clever, I'm really a big fan of this mechanism. Just choose the slits in which you want to mount the camera plate and set it in place. And now the top part of the frame is assembled. And then it mounts to those right angle brackets using screws coming in from the side. Now let's take a look at some photos from the actual build. For this build, I decided to go ahead and try the trick of running the ESC wires underneath the ESC, between the ESC and the arm, and then folding them over the top of the ESC and soldering some the motor pads. Uh, the advantage of this trick, as was pointed out to me by commenters on a previous video, is that it lets you get the ESC closer to the motor, and it also gives you some extra length of wire to work with if you need to do any rework. Uh, I think there's an advantage in getting the ESC closer to the motor in that it makes it harder for the prop to strike the ESC. But I'm not actually sure that that's a good thing. I've had ESCs get hit by props fairly regularly, and I have yet to actually kill an ESC by doing that. Maybe I've just been lucky, or maybe it's the type of prop I use. I don't know. Whereas the ESC power wires and signal wire, the first time they get hit by a prop, they're definitely going to get damaged and potentially going to need to be replaced. So if I can't find a way to make sure that the wires are not getting hit, I might almost rather have the ESC get hit than the wires. And this goes back to the concept that I talked about in another video, choose your breakpoints. Something's going to get hit by the prop, what would you like it to be? Whenever I build a copter, I make sure that I leave myself enough wire to be able to take the top plate, or in this case the top half of the frame, 
off and set it aside. This lets me get at all the stuff that's in the top and the base of the copter without having to unplug everything and makes life a lot simpler. It just really eases maintenance. It doesn't make for the absolute cleanest install. You can certainly shorten your wires up if you're willing to forego this, but boy, it makes your day-to-day -day life a lot easier. In order to be able to take the top of the copter off, you need to mount your video transmitter and your receiver on the top plate because that's usually where those antennas are going to be mounted and of course you can't separate the video transmitter and the receiver from their antennas very easily. If you're very creative, you may figure out a way to mount the video transmitter, the receiver, and their antennas on the bottom of the copter, but it usually gets pretty crowded down there and that usually is tricky and, and probably would just make a mess. So you mount the video transmitter and the receiver on the top plate and in this case, that was pretty tricky to do because the top plate is relatively short because the frame up tilts uh, at the front and you, you lose the top plate. So there's no underside of the top plate for you to mount to. Here you can see I've stacked the X4R receiver and the video transmitter to each other. I didn't actually end up going this way because I just didn't like how it worked out. If you D-pin your X4R, it will fit on the top plate with a typical TS5823 size transmitter. If you do not de-pin it, you're going to need to do something like have the pins face down or at an angle in order to get them both to fit. This is not specific to this build, but I did want to show you how I decided to mount the buzzer to the version 2.1 X-Racer F303 flight controller that I'm using in this build. Version 2.1 of that flight controller is the first one to include through holes for the buzzer. I know, right? Seems pretty obvious. But the through holes are close enough together that it's a little tricky to get the buzzer to fit, especially because the buzzers that I'm using don't come with very long legs. The legs are sort of short and stubby. So what I've done here is I'm actually mounting the buzzer on the underside uh, because mounting it on the top would get in the way of the bootloader button, which you can see just to the left of the buzzer. And I've passed the positive leg through the positive hole, and then I've wrapped the negative leg around the top of the board, and I've soldered them both down. And I like this approach a lot because it, it, it provides some structural rigidity that you don't get if you've just soldered the legs into the holes. If you decide to do this, make sure you pay attention to the underside of the board and make sure there's nothing under there, no components that you might accidentally be shorting out. I put a little piece of foam tape on the underside to make sure I maintained electrical separation between the legs of the buzzer and any components on the underside of the board. And here you can see I have installed a 1000 microfarad electrolytic capacitor uh, as is good practice. I often find that I have trouble fitting this onto a build, but there's actually a nice little compartment in the back of this frame where nothing else goes, and it tucks up there very nicely, is well protected from any sort of damage, and I feel very comfortable putting it into this build. I'm going to leave you with some final photos of the completed build. Well, almost completed. You see, I still haven't put an XT60 on there because I've run out of that XT60 connector. Oops. But uh, it's basically the finished build, and um, you can see what it looks like. I have one more video coming where I have some wrap-up comments and final thoughts that came to me while I was doing the build. I'm going to put that up shortly after this one. And in the meantime, happy flying.